our esteemed roundtable artists have arrived. So we'll take a breath, and when we're seated, we'll begin. And we have two mics, right? OK. I'm going to start by, first of all, pulling out my notes. Because there's so much excitement and juice. And I was taking notes this morning and went back and thought about more questions for us to ask. So I will refer to them. I don't have any. Everyone else has notes. I don't have notes. Sydney? Yes. That I was your assignment. I you didn't read the email, oh, obviously. Should I get the paper? Oh, dear. Well, we'll help her out. Everyone okay, will help her out, yes. Yeah. <laughs> We're all here for each other. We are. Okay. Welcome to the Director's Roundtable. Yes. I am honored to, um, to host, to be the moderator for this esteemed panel. And I'll, I'll start with introducing myself. My name is Awotunde Judy Ella Albilali. And again, I am honored to be in this position as a moderator. Welcome and gratitude, huge gratitude, to our conveners who have done a remarkable job that just keeps growing. You know, before we all arrived, we were talking about how excited we are. We still seem to be massively excited as we proceed. To our participants and to our artistic ancestors whose presence is so deeply felt in these spaces. I would like to begin with a moment of, uh, of stillness and silence. It's another kind of aspect of land acknowledgement where we're just still and silent and really feel deeply into the land that is holding us and nurturing us. This is my first visit to Minneapolis and there's something about the generative, artistic, um, uh, um, quality of this pl place that is delicious to me. And it would not be possible without the land. So just a moment to sit. Thank you. And it's a process that we can do any time of the day. Land acknowledgement is an organic process. Um, this is the first time I'm meeting my creative sisters here. <laughs> and uh, I, I've, I, I attend, uh, attended two of the sessions this morning, very different in the jazz aesthetic, right? Very different styles of, of moderating. And I did write out and would like to read short bios because I like to be a praise singer for black women, okay? So I, I, will, I will do that. Before I do, I'll say that this convening, this space is one of those moments where everyone in the room will say, I was there. It will be referred to. Um, n not only in the world of theater and the world of arts, in the world. Mm. There is a current that we embody with our love and focus and genius and passion and skill and experience, truly intergenerational, dare I say interdimensional movement that is being felt right now in the world. You will see, it's different. I was making lots and lots of notes because I, I am a writer as well. And we have opened a new timeline. When I say opened a new timeline, when people of, of great heart and mind and skill, devotion, we put years in the game in this, come together with an idea and a focus, a new timeline, literally, this is physics, opens up. And you can feel one happening as we move forward. Um, in my emails to the directors, and we all had phone conversations, right, which was fun. It's, I started three weeks ago because they're very busy, and it took that time to get everyone on the phone. Um, but I asked them to share as we go through to begin with their 
artistic roots, their creative journeys, and to situate themselves in the tradition of theatrical jazz, in the jazz aesthetic, just as a jumping off point. The questions will arise spontaneously. I have some based on our conversations. Some have morphed together. You know, all of these women put themselves in the center of the room. Sometimes we say the front of the room, because women, we do it a little differently, at the center of the room and hold the room and the bravery and the genius of that in different ways. So we definitely want to hear about that as we go forward. I even gave them an order to speak in because I'm a Capricorn, and that makes me feel good. You see? Yes. We, we make a list and then we change it, but that list is really very helpful. And before I do read their, their bios, I want to acknowledge one of our great artistic ancestors and a woman who was a mentor and a friend and a big sister to me, Aisha Rahman. Her name was spoken this morning and I just clapped with enthusiasm. She's a massive presence, a standard bearer in the American theater. And is in these words, uh, from a couple of interviews that I researched have shaped who we are and where we are right now. So let me read that. She says, I can't seem to write without music. Music in the shape of the drama, if not the content. The multi-layered, contrapuntal, offbeat, accentuated, polyphonal, improvisational structures seem to be the way I perceive life, and music is the bone of my imagination. She goes on to say, I was committed to the truth-telling of black lives, especially women's, in the face of silence, and I knew that we African Americans were a jazz people who lived improvis improvisatory lives in multi-realities, so why couldn't the music be adapted as dramatic structure? Mm -hmm. Coming out of the 50s, my friends, mm -hmm. right? Um, a fellow Harlemite, and, as I said, a standard bearer in the American theater. So let me read these um, bios in order, and look, they all sat the way I suggested that they would. <laughs> and then, then I'll turn it over. And I even shamelessly gave them timing. Forget it. Say all you need to do and take the time you need. It, don't worry about it. Just, just improv. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I might say, could you hold that point? Yeah, I might do that, I might do that. Okay. Ebony Noel Golden is a theater ceremonialist, cultural stra culture strategist, entrepreneur, and public scholar. Yes, Yay, in 2009, Ebony founded Betty's Daughter Arts Collective, a culture consultancy that devises systems, strategies, and social justice solutions nationally. In 2020, she founded Jupiter Performance Studio, a space to study and practice black diasporic performance traditions. Winner of the Association for Theater and Higher Education's Transformational Practice Award, Golden works to incite and ignite the creative capacity of everyday folks in service of liberation and collective well-being. Her practice is rooted in community design, ritual performance, and leadership development through a liberatory eco-womanist praxis. Invoking messy, magical, and medicinal processes, Ebony and her collaborators work to conjure a better world. Thank you. Signe. Signe. It's because Lori said Signe, so I feel you can say what you need to say. No, okay, Lori's in the room, so she said we could do it. Um, but it comes from having worked with uh, the wonderful Sidney Mahone. So Sidney V. Haraday is a director, multidisciplinary artist, and performer. She is co-founder of Mama Mosaic and currently the artistic producing director of Pillsbury House and Theater located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. What? Hey. As a corporate higher education and organizational trainer, Signe has more than 20 years of extensive experience using creative dramatics to work with people of all ages, from elementary age to seniors. She has developed different arts-based programs and curriculum to meet the needs of collaborating arts organizations, 
participating individuals, and her own desire to be a positive agent of social change through the arts in her community. She says, and I quote, I understand vividly that there can be no racial justice without healing. Art is a pathway not only to envisioning the world we need, but also to heal from the world we live in as we build the world we want. That's that new timeline, Signe. Mm. Regina Victor, an artist who uses the pronouns they, them, and Pharaoh, is a multidisciplinary artist, an intuitive storyteller committed to creating a better future, better futures on and off stage. Victor is a cultural critic, and in 2017, they founded Rescripted, an online arts journalism platform, and have also written for American Theater, Playbill, and HowlRound. In 2023, they were placed in the Hall of Fame for New City's, quote, 50 people who really perform for Chicago. Mm. A proud Bay Area native, Regina is a prominent new play director, having recently developed directed a developmental workshop of Ari D. Knox. Ari D. Knox. Uh, a Wallness Church, the Black Women's Guide to Making God at the Playwright Center of Minneapolis. Mm. They've directed readings and workshop at, at, workshops at Actors Theater of Louisville, Long Wharf Theater, Timeline Theater, and more. As a dramaturg and script supervisor, Victor's specialty is helping writers craft great stories. Pharaoh has been bringing stories to life since before Y2K and spent most of her early career on stage. Thank you. So, Ebony, theater ceremonialist. <laughs> okay. Artistic roots and theatrical jazz lineages. Hey, y'all. Hey. Hi. I'm from Houston, Texas. My people are from East Texas and Louisiana, from Shreveport all the way down to New Orleans. Um, I was raised in Harlem Clark, a working class black and Chicano neighborhood on the south side of Houston. And um, I come from working people, working class people. I come from people who are deeply spiritual, deeply faithful, uh, deeply creative and poetic, complicated, layered, nuanced. Um, have a lot to fight about and a lot to love about. I bring all of that into the room. Um, so I want to say that I'm really here as an evangelist and a devotee. And um, I am one of the many people whose lives have been shifted, changed, transformed, turned around by the gospel of theatrical jazz. Um, and it is, has been a rehabilitation in my body, in my sense and sensibilities, in the way I understand what it means to be a human in the world, to be a part of this cosmology. And um, I, I, I'm gonna answer the question, I am answering the question. Um, but I want to, you know, I wanna say that it is my work in the world since I got hip to this way of being in the world, to share it as often as I can. I've given so many copies of books and primers and YouTube videos to people, whether they are an artist or not, right, to um, bring them into the number. I think if you believe it, and you know that it's real medicine, it's important to share it. And um, regardless of what I want my work to be, I know that the, this way of making work is a way maker, a way finder, um, a way to open us up to the deepest parts of ourselves and make that revelation 
felt and palpable for other people and other folks. And I didn't know that I needed it or wanted it until it was gifted to me, this way of working. Um, and so artistically, um, I, I think I, I, I have a, a similar lineage to some other folks that um, I've heard speaking today. Sharon talked about the, you know, the musicality and the artistic roots of her family being what, you know, she brings to her work. And I find it to be the same. My grandfather played the harmonica and would sing the blues while, you know, cooking and fishing and made sure I knew how to play the harmonica before I could actually really even talk. Um, you know, my grandmother was in a touring gospel quartet and that toured like East Texas and Louisiana. I didn't find that out about her until she passed. Um, my mother made sure I knew poetry and wrote poetry. I mean, I come from people who really value art, not just going to see it and witness it, but making it. And it's evident in style and fashion and food and love and anger and ritual of everyday life and spirit. Um, you know, it's important for me to say that most of my early childhood is really um, supported by public schools, magnet schools, where I was able to fast track through arts programming as, at a very young age. And that really set the tone of how I make work and who it's for and why it's being made and who has access to it. Um, because it wasn't until I was really essentially an adult that I started the bougie art journey. But it's not where I'm from and it's not what I value most about how I understand how to be creative in the world. But I wanted to study and train, you know, and so, um, but I'm, my foundation, many, many teachers, many Girl Scout theater programs and many Christmas you know, plays at in elementary school, many spring concerts, all of that kind of stuff um, is is my root, and I I don't ever um, take that lightly, you know, because it really is how I attune my ear to folk, to folk. Um, and what I was listening to as a child and who I was listening to as a child is critical to being able to hear the inner child and in other people as adults now. Um, and being encouraged to be weird and creative and out on a limb, literally, um, for the art is important. It's already come up around risk and rigor and the ability the capacity to actually deal with chaos and confusion as an aesthetic is one that I developed as a child. Not because of trauma, although of course there's lots of trauma going on in the world, you know, but because I learned very early on to deal with uncertainty as an artist and as a human being. Okay, let's, let's move this along to the, this theatrical jazz moment. So in, in the early 2000s, I go to grad school. I um, am in DC and I'm studying with, with um, Bernice Johnson Regan, not art, I'm studying history um, in her class, but I'm there for an art degree. Anyway, she's at American, I'm at American. This is black DC. Right, and so every night of the week during this time, you can go somewhere along U Street and beyond to experience um, all kinds of things happening. I'm also sneaking into Tony Medina, Sonia Sanchez's classes at Howard, undergraduate classes, because that's where they were teaching. I'm also going to open mics every night. I'm also in a women's arts collective. And of course we have to do for colored girls. And of course we have to tour this thing around the city. And of course 
I'm told that I must direct it. And you know, this is a very common through line story. Whatever, fast track, go somewhere, do something, fall in love, fall out of love, land in New York City. Uh, in graduate school again, and, um, and decided like three months in that I did not want to get a PhD. You could imagine why, performance studies, NYU, blah, 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 yakety smackety. I wrap up that process, right, and land in a workshop with Sharon Bridgeforth at the Audrey Lord Project in Brooklyn. All right, this is where life takes a turn. And I'm gonna backtrack. When I, I lived in North Carolina, I had a similar life-shifting experience with Dr. Soyini Madison, who um, taught at UNC Chapel Hill, Northwestern. We just did an honoring for her at Northwestern about a month and a half or two months ago. Dr. Omi was there, it was beautiful. Nevertheless, back to Brooklyn. So I submit some poems to this person named Sharon Bridgeforth, who I loosely know because I am from Texas. Austin is down the street. and. It's popping in Austin. Everybody, like the Austin Project is going on. Everything is going on. These things are really like quite interesting that I went all the way to New York to grab hold of what's going on in Texas. And I, you know, okay, of course I had to leave home to find home. So I take this course, this workshop at the Audrey Lord Project with Sharon. And she basically, you know, is like, oh, okay, great. You've read Ntozaki Shange, very good for you. Um, and we, I can see that in your writing and so on and so forth. And I'm like, but there's something more. And she's like, there's a lot more. And, and this begins really this, this deep, this deep long distance durational study that helps me to really understand what kind of art I want to make. And so it is quite literally being mentored and trained by the archive first. I had to find what, what was in the gap in order for me to actually literally find the people. But it's, and it's already been mentioned like books, bookish research, ethnography, going to where people are. And that's been my journey. I've been on a road that is about discovery for most of my life. From the Audre Lorde Project and Sharon, a series of things began to unfold where I'm introduced to Dr. Omi's work and introduced to Daniel Alexander Jones. And this is very sobering because I'm like, where have y'all been all my life? Where have you been all my life? What would I be? How would I be? Who would I be as an artist and beyond if I met y'all you know, 15 years ago? I felt duped by all of the systems that these people have been literally circling around and I did not know them. And so I studied, I studied. And you know, I have to say this because here's the time where I can say it, when I was directing Sharon's show at Pillsbury House, um, I received a novel. The, the, the book that we ended up staging was just pages of a novel, y'all. There were no characters, there were no stage directions. And I said, what am I supposed to do with this, Sharon? And she said, it will all be revealed. Who's supposed to say what? We've cast this thing. Who says what? It will all be revealed. Who's supposed to, re what, who's going to get the revelation? Am I waiting for it? Are you going to, is it going to be revealed to you? And then you tell me, it will all be revealed. I had no clue what to do until it was revealed. Yeah. It's a wild ride. It's a wild ride to be a devotee to say this is what you've been waiting for and it actually arrives. What do you do with it? It said on the, on the cover of the novel, performance novel, a blues novel. What's that? You making up stuff. <laughs> it was a journey. You know, I wasn't, of course I wasn't alone. It's already been mentioned. Alexis was the dramaturg and Ma Quay was our vocal composer. So it was not, of course, I didn't have to, it wasn't just, had, didn't have to just be revealed to me. It had to be revealed to a whole community. 
And it, it wasn't revealed, you know, all at the same time. And, and that can take me a lot of places, but I think I'm gonna pause on, you know, what I learned as a director, you know, through that process. And I wanna just say, I'm in the tradition of Sharon Bridgeforth and Dr. Omi Oshu and Joni L. Jones, most directly, if I did not read and study those people, I would not know how to wait for revelation to arrive in a creative capacity. Um, and it's a very sobering thing to be able to call these people on the phone. I'm so glad they're not in here, I'd probably be crying. Are they in here? They're not in here. I'm so glad they're not in here, I'd probably be crying and, you know, but it's really a, quite a thing to meet your teachers in a way that allows you to c continue to evolve. Um, I'll say one more thing and then I'll pass it. I'll just say this. In another related and unrelated event, I was, I had a sleepover with Ntozaki Shange and some other folks and I slept in her library. Ooh. This was a wild, this is wild. And she put me in there. I'm like, I'm sleeping in a library. I'm sleeping in Ntozaki Shange's library in Brooklyn. Who's supposed to do that? You know, there's like, there's no one linear story. There's not one map. But I just, I just have to like drop these things in. Because, you know, sitting very unclear about how I get to be one of four people at this sleepover that was organized by people I did, you know, that were, came, all came from the Bay was really quite interesting. But it's something when all of that is given to gift it to you, what do you do with it? You, you serve. You serve. And, and so I, I think I'll wrap up by saying that's what... That's, that's what this tradition, this cosmology, this worldview is teaching me, is how to work in service of people in a way that's generative, in a way that is uh, full of reciprocity, in a way that's ego harmonizing. And if you, if you get to it, you can make some art as well. But it's not always the goal. It's not always the goal. Very rarely is it the goal for me. It, seem, it may seem like it because I'm always somewhere making art, but there's a lot more going on where this worldview and way of being is concerned for me. So yeah. Well, damn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm. I'm saying that. I'm just letting it wash on me just a little bit. Um, okay, y'all, can, can we do something together? Okay, this is my introduction. I'm gonna try to be concise, even though that's not my gift. Can you, uh, if this is available to you, can you look at the palm of your hand? And I want you to just take a moment and look at the lines if this is available to you in the palm of your hands. Notice what lines connect, what lines stand alone, what lines seem to have a journey of their own, what are closer to the surface, what are deeper into the flesh of your hand. And just noticed the cosmology, thank you for that gift of a word, the cosmology of those lines. And as I look at mine in front of you, and I listen to what Judy and Ebony and so many people have said, I feel like this is an archive in the palm of your hand the ways in which our lives are interconnected, the ways that they are sometimes not. And it feels like a visual representation of the story that I'm gonna share with you and a story I'm sure you have of your own that brought you here in the palm of your hand. Thank you for 
obliging me with that. And part of it is because I see the connections, like as a director, like that part of my art form, it's about finding the connections. A friend of mine recently wrote a book, um, Susan Raffo, uh, called Liberated to the Bone, and she talks about healing in this book and that healing is really us just trying to get reconnected, getting back to connections. So as you spoke, as you both spoke, I'm thinking about all of the connections of what got me here and what got me into theatrical jazz. So like uh, these beautiful people on the stage with me, I grew up in the church. My daddy was a pastor. And uh, he, my mama would type his sermons that he would write by hand. And I grew up with a church organist who became my grandmother. And, and my church experience is different than a lot of other people's church experiences, I'm sure. But it was spiritual and it was guided by story. And I think that, that that's the thing that pulls me in is how do I find the story that unlocks the healing, that unlocks the journey, that connects me to something I didn't know was possible, that teaches me that. You talk about being an evangelist. I, I think that is our work. I think that is my work. I think that is my calling. And I arrive here as a descendant of multiple generations of pastors on both my mother and my father's side. And I think this is like my ministry. Um, and I believe that it is spiritually guided. I don't always know God's name. I don't always know uh, whose wind is pushing me. But I'm going to tell you, there is wind pushing me. And I, I often attribute it to my ancestors. I also attribute it to the land and the spiritual gifts of being in relationship to land that offer. And I, and I attribute it to the many people who touch my life. Many of the people in this room who have changed the, the lines in my hand to help me see something I couldn't see before, make something I hadn't made before. And so bits of that story, childhood church, yes, to arts in school, Los Angeles Center for Enriched Studies. My mama used to drive me 60 miles across town in Los Angeles to go to African drum class on Saturday mornings. I know that changed me. I begged my mother to take me to a church basement to teach me to learn how to speak Norwegian because that is also my heritage. Didn't stick, didn't work. But something in me has always had a longing for understanding what was behind me. So my grandmother's name on my mother's side is Signe. My father's mother's name is Hattie Victoria. That is why I use the V in my name, Victoria, because that was her middle name. They were both deceased when my parents were quite young. And I wonder if there is power in what we name things. Having my grandmother's names makes me feel like I have mother, my grandmothers with me all the time. Even though I ain't never met them, I know them. So fast forward, I uh, grew up in Los Angeles, was born and raised there. My parents met here in Minneapolis. My father was uh, the second black man to graduate from St. Olaf College. My mother was a student at Augsburg when my father was in seminary at Luther Seminary right here in St. Paul, Minnesota, where he was the first black man ordained out of, Saint, out of uh, Luther Seminary. And my parents were engaged to be married, and that wasn't cute in the 60s. My mother got letters from the KKK. Uh, she was harassed out of Augsburg College because she was engaged to a black man. But at their wedding... All the people poured out and they had a potluck. And I think about the ways that we engage food in ceremony, which is something that Lori also very much believed in, and the tradition of how we make stories and make family, even when our chosen family ain't ready for that shit. So that was a little bit about my birth. And then uh, I was born in Los Angeles because my father was called to a church there. They always wanted to raise a family here, came back here to Minnesota when I was in high school, went to college here. Uh, 
and then uh, was trying to do that art thing. While I was in college, a black professor gave me, there was not very many of them at my school, gave me a book of nine plays of black women. Coming to college, I thought Anton Chekhov was black. <laughs> do you know any white Antons? No. No. I also thought Tennessee Williams was black. Y'all, this is before the internet. I'm just, I'm just saying. I had, I had cause for my pause. Uh, so anyway, I was always a lover of the arts and the, and the theaters and the things and was doing a production of For Colored Girls at Penumbra Theater, an important black institution in this community um, that, and I mentioned this yesterday, but I will repeat it here in case people were not, a production that was directed by Kim Moore, choreographed by Joel Branner, dramaturged by Lori Carlos, and a whole bunch of uh, women of color who were doing this production. And in the uh, dressing room, we were like, oh, this is so good. I feel so seen. This is, we gotta do this. So we went to the paper to audition. That's what you did back then in classifieds. What section of the Star Trib? The 550s. There's like one person in the room who knows that. That's okay. It's okay, it was a time. You went to the 550s in the Star Tribune to look for the audition announcements and there was nothing for black and brown women. So we said, okay, well, we're gonna make our own theater. So me and Shay and Jeannie, Jeannie Park, Shay Cage, created Mama Mosaic, and we went, and our first gig was to tell stories for a free Mumia event. And at that event, we wrote some stories, we told our stories, and uh, everybody had left, and we were filing out of the theater, and this woman grabbed me in the aisle, and she looked me in the eye, and she said, thank you for telling my story. I've never heard it on stage. I have no idea who that woman is. She made a line in my hand. And I understood my calling more deeply. Mama Mosaic started, lots of other things I could tell you about. And I'm gonna stop there because it's too much to try to share and I wanna leave you with the, the sensation of the hand and I open my hand to you as a gesture that if we have not yet connected, let's find a way to. And I mean that sincerely because I know that the power of our connection is what's gonna heal me. Oh, I was just, oh, wow. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Wow. I have to. We could all breathe. So I have to transition now from paying attention so acutely into trying to turn that lens to myself a little bit. Um, thank you for everything that has been said so far and for inviting me into this space. I don't take that lightly. I very much feel, I just wrote, theatrical jazz, like many things, has been present for me almost fortunately for most of my life, but I am just now really understanding what it means to answer this call as an artist and as a person. And there's other calls. These lines have been ringing for a long time, right? But my father was a jazz musician, is a jazz musician, Victor Fields. And I grew up doing musical theater and doing jazz um, and singing jazz. And so it's an art form that I already had this deep intimacy with. And um, we also, in my family um, are metaphysicians or mystics, right? So I love how much spirituality has been invoked um, around this work and around this process. I am on a journey, calls that have been, you know, needing to be answered, but I've been on a journey for the past two years around what it means to be an embodied God. I believe we all have a spark of divinity inside of us. We are made in his image in that way, right? Her image in that way. And we are um, a refraction of each other. We're wearing different faces like a diamond, right? This is a Yoruba concept as well. And so that to me has meant complete transparency, accountability, and responsibility to my fellow people and the things that I create. And there is something so rooted in theatrical jazz to me um, around the composition. I'm in a journey of decomposition and composition and studying these things very closely. I'm very into um, 
diving down into the essence of things, right? I was a religious studies major in college. I think this is just, you'll hear me kind of talking in a way that it's good to have this context of me and where I'm at as a person right now. Um, I'm from Oakland. I love that about me. <laughs> um, thank you, you know? Um, and I'm thinking about this land acknowledgement is, is an organic process. I'm just calling that back in the space. I've been really feeling what it is to root in different communities and receive them and whatever they are offering me, right? And I think what this place, what Minneapolis has offered me is really understanding where my artistic lineage has come from. Walking into Pillsbury the other day, I mean, it, it really was profound. Um, it's like my friend said, when myth becomes man, right? When you really are able to finally touch something that you've heard about, that you've dreamed about, you know? Um, so all that to say, um, I, began this journey officially, I would say around like 2015, is when I met um, Daniel Alexander Jones and Omi Oshun, um, and by association, Sharon Bridgeforth. Um, and I was working on Gem of the Ocean. I was assistant directing Gem of the Ocean. And it was right before I was really embracing my gender expansion as well, you know? And so I was very fragile. It's like not the best time when you're like on the cusp of that self-realization. And being around Daniel, who also performs as Joe Mama Jones, and seeing how fluidly he was able to move in and out of these spaces was really expansive for me. It was formative for me. And then a Dr. Oshun's dramaturgy was based in Yoruba cosmology. And I had never seen these things come together. Because I used to say, uh, religious studies is the class and theater is the laboratory where I get to practice. So I'm studying the core of why people do what they do, what wakes them up in the morning, what is your, your, your tree of faith, right, in that way. So um, he also introduced me to LaBelle. Um, <laughs> and I think Patti LaBelle's ability to transform throughout her career has also been very seminal to me. Um, I'm thinking about the fact that I call my mother a lawyer narrator because she was always in this act of composition. We would, she would tell me stories that would go on for years and she would remember all the details of these stories. And I think that had a really profound effect on me that I didn't really get till a few years ago. I mean, it, it was an incredible thing to do for someone who does not identify as an artist. But she had a very strong sense of play and, a, and she has a strong sense of, of, um, of narrative, right? And of story and why it's important. And I love that you brought up names. Do you know my middle name is Victoria? <laughs> I've shortened it to Regina Victor because, isn't that wild? <laughs> um, emotional, but I shortened it to Regina Victor because um, those are my parents' names. And part of my gender journey, I was like, I love having my mother's name and my father's name and this equally weighted, both six letters, beautiful. Wow, um, I've been seeing the number 66 and I've just never made that correlation. So we're, thank you for being at my revelation right now. I'm figuring it out. Um, wow, okay, that was exciting. So after this production of Gem of the Ocean, which was this deconstructed beautiful thing, right? Uh, it was inspired by Carol Walker and Romare Bearden and it was much collage and gesture and I was exposed to this really rich world. I then did um, Anna Devere Smith's Notes from the Field and that production um, often has a, a bassist. Um, and that bassist that time was uh, Marcus Shelby, uh, who originated that show. And my role in that show is so funny because I both was a, a session leader. That show used to have an intermission that was a conversation. So um, we would lead a dialogue that was relatively improvised based on the people that were there, that was intended to guide them towards solutions around the school to prison pipeline. So I'm having that community experience. And then I'm also working as um, her stand-in because of course, when you're a one person actor, you never get to watch your show. So I would act, they didn't actually tell me I was gonna have to act for her, by the way, that's a fun fact. They told me that three minutes before she showed up and the show started, um, but it was great. And. Being able to play with Marcus in a theatrical sense as one person, um, following this narrative with him and, and hearing how his music is telling a different story so soon after having that experience led me to how I define theatrical jazz when I'm working, like when I'm just talking to people. 
and I and I know that we, but I, I think it's good to speak it. I always say, like, when you listen to a jazz song, you know, it's a melody, it's cohesive, but if you pull those instruments apart, they all sound like they're playing a completely different song. Um, and so I think about that in terms of the light, the set, the sound, the, the actors' bodies, and the gestural vocabulary that I have adopted and now really work in. They are all telling the same story in drastically different ways. So those gestures will not be correlated to the text, right? But if I see that you're constantly like wiping your brow when you're talking about a certain part, I might be like, what, is, what does it look like to get energy out of our head? Like, what is this plucking doing? What is like, I'll just start to explore that with an actor and figure out. Because I think you should be able to watch a show and know what's happening. You should be able to hear a show and know what's happening, right? It's also kind of an accessibility tactic that you can engage with this story any way that you're able to find an open door. Okay. Thinking about um, that continued lineage a little bit, a couple other people I just, I do wanna name. Sharon um, Bridgeforth, last year when I came to do a Wallace Church, um, was such a vital part of that process, just speaking to me, watching, reflecting, and um, gave me the Dem Blessings deck from the da the da Black Mermaid Land. Wait, did you, wait. Oh, sorry, I got excited. I thought you pointed at someone. I was like, did someone make it? <laughs> Can they direct it that we're have, we, should, we should reveal some things momentarily, but you should finish. That's so exciting. Wow. That's so exciting. Okay, thank you. Um, so excited to talk about that. Wow. The Oracle deck. Gosh, okay. Um, so I was given this deck and it was the first time that I really was like, oh, my spirituality really can live in this theatrical world. I've been reading tarot for the last five years. And so when I told Sharon this, they were like, here, please take this. And I have it with me in the hotel. And I continue to carry it and I continue to pull and I started doing it in rehearsal. I will pull from different decks, usually all created by Black Femmes. Um, because I think this decomposition and composition I always return to, right? Tarot is so about the essence. It's about the archetype. It's about before you got into how you were expressing this thing and how it's walking in the world, like what are you trying to do? What's your root, you know? Um, so I'm thinking, I'm scatting a little bit, thank you. I'm just trying to go through these things and collect these pieces. I also want to name Felicia Rashad, um, was one of Daniel Alexander Jones's mentors and I got to work with her now twice. Um, once on The Roommate at Steppenwolf as an assistant director and then most recently um, as an assistant director and dramaturg at Theater Aspen Solo Flights with Regina Taylor, who I think is a genius. Um, and to be between these women, it was like being in a jazz concert. Like they're going back and forth and I'm like Googling things and I'm pulling out information and it's like this really fast, exciting and electric thing. And I think that style of composing where we're really depending on each other, really listening to each other, really um, picking up and playing those changes together is so exciting. And then thinking about playing changes, um, Daniel recently wrote an essay for me for Rescripted um, called Playing Changes, and that series was called Decomposition Instead of Collapse. Because we're all like in this thing about, oh, it's collapsing, and I love that you said new timeline, because I do think that we are opening a door. We are opening a new pathway. There is something for us <laughs> that we have to trust will be revealed. Right? But if we keep working in this way, we will find it. I really have faith in that. And then I have to name Rael Myrick Hodges, um, is my mentor, that's my girl. And even though I don't know that Rael would say she identifies as a theatrical jazz practitioner, it is all I have ever seen her do. And, it, <laughs> and we did a production of Pipeline at Indiana Repertory Theater and a production of Fences at California Shakespeare Theater. And I have never seen someone just like decompose a play like that. Just be like, what do you really need? Or to say, hey, this play is about Rose. What if we could see into the house? What if we saw her the entire time? right, and she's actually just the main character. <laughs> um, what if this lot is just, you know, this little square, it doesn't have to have anything in it except the texture. Like, just watching her put together these essentials to make a fabulous composition. She's a very visual director, a very cerebral person. Which will bring me to the last thing I think I wanna say. 
which is you said Oracle deck, and that's why also my brain will stop and go through 97 revelations at once. But I identify strongly as a scribe, and I've been talking about the oracle versus scribe kind of archetype and how those things go together, thinking about Jesus and Peter, thinking about Moses and Aaron. You find this repeating throughout history. And when I think about scripture and being a scribe, right? Like I think a lot of people think of rescripted as an archive. And I love that you brought the word archive into the space because I think as someone who likes to scribe what is happening, who's taking notes, I mean, I'm reviewing live theater, so it's just, it's truly notes, it's truly records, right? But to organize that information, to make sense of that information, you need to be an archivist. And so I'm kind of obsessed with like finding and serving archivists. That is a real um, part of my life. And it was so exciting to hear you say that because I'll be directing Wallace Church in the fall. And also like I work in community composition, right? That is the thing, I'm, I'm constantly trying to reflect communities back to themselves. So some of my, my work that I do in community, I'm looking to you because I'm so excited to also talk to you about that. Um, but some of the work that I do is around, we call it, it, I am the cultural strategist for something called the Bombay Beach Biennale. This town, and I can say this to this group, this town is a half mile by a half mile and the ground is made of bone. And as a fan of Gem of the Ocean, this really freaked me out. But um, we throw an art festival there, and it's, we don't sell tickets, and about 6,000 people come. And figuring out this vast, radical hospitality relies on knowing all the parts, all the instruments, and making this composition come together and flow, because that is the only thing holding us together. And so to do that in a social experiment has been incredibly rewarding as well. I think I'm going to leave it there. to take my shoes off. You all got me. <laughs> I had to really grab directors as conduits of the divine. All right, I'm going to read, um, I'm going to share the same questions that I asked uh, my, my sisters here. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And will you forgive me? I'm actually going to read my own bio because otherwise I get lost. Uh, our Tunde Judiel Al-Balali is a theater artist, writer, and arts educator. She has performed and directed off-Broadway at regional theaters and is the artistic godmother of Reemergence Collective, based in New England. Ah. Currently professor of theater for social transformation. Is there any other kind of theater? Okay. At the University of Massachusetts Amherst, she has taught internationally, notably as a Fulbright Scholar at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa where she founded an applied theater company, Brown Paper Studio. Judy is the author of a memoir for the feeling, Love and Transformation, From New York to Cape Town, Halcyon Days, a book of haiku poetry, and three plays, The Death of Black and White, Ice House, and Savior's Day. Her newest book and performance project is Between Tattoos, a biomythography. And I am very honored, to, I was invited to share some of that in performance tomorrow. So I'll, I'll answer the same questions that uh, I posed. I want to begin with gratitude to my parents, Lillian Bertha Brandt, who was a jazz singer uh, before she had a pioneering career in the fashion industry, and my father, George Brandt, who was a self-taught black scholar, he black studies, and who sold liquor in Harlem. And there are people in this room that know those extraordinary people, so they are, yeah, okay. We are, we, many ancestors are standing with us. Um, both children of Caribbean immigrants. I want to say that their voice shines through every studio, every classroom, every rehearsal I'm in because they never, ever doubted my right to be an artist and a black artist at that. There was no question. And that absolute confidence radiates to my students and, and sometimes to my colleagues. You know, we doubt we are under such pressure to simply be in the world. And I come from a home that said, you, you have a right to be, shine, keep shining. Mm -hmm. um, I want to extend huge gratitude to Omi Oshun, who getting all the accolades and all the love mm -hmm. for having crystallized and brought this universe of theatrical jazz into the world. When we first started working together, um, 
I guess the book was about two years old. It was, it was, it was pretty new, and I was sharing it with the graduate students, just like we do now. It's like, read it and tell me what you got. You know, I wouldn't try to audacity to teach theatrical jazz, but I said, what are you getting? And at that time, the, it was being talked about, but nobody, certainly nobody in the academy knew about it. And I said, Omi is sometimes is best when something is really fire that it's quiet at first. Because, right. right. ooh, 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 how about all that glitz happens fast? It's been done before. It's everybody trying to get on. This, this landed in, in, the, in the most healing way of nuclear energy. It's silent first, isn't it? And then, and, and with, a, with no destruction, with, with opening, now we see, now we see. This energy is rising and unstoppable. It's plutonium. Pluton Aquarius for the astrologers who are in here. We'll talk about that more. Ah, okay. So I, when I read it, I went, wow, I belong to something. I have a creative home. I've been just plodding along, you know, decades long in the game. I know we're doing something, but what is it? And she, uh, in, in that beautiful, multi-layered, even the, even the color and the graphics of it, gave me a mirror into myself. Uh, and, and in the conversation we had a couple of years ago, I interviewed she and Jola when everything was in lockdown and could only be done by Zoom. And I asked her, I said, you know, only I, I get it. I, I, I get the Yoruba uh, uh, references to cosmology. I understand Ashe. I understand Egbe. But I said, Awo, that's the one. I, my name is Awo Tunde. And that was the most mysterious to me. And she laughed. She said, well, it is the mystery. It's the moment that comes through. It's that it's that spark of, in, it's the solo, it's that spark of inspiration. It's when you have gone, you're playing and playing and playing and then you just have to break and sing that song, Awo Tunde. And so the meaning of my name is initiate returns. So there's something about the connection of that process in jazz. And again, what I am, dare I say in this space, being recorded, called to do, but I can say it because I'm in the company of all of you that are so clearly called to do this. It's pretty audacious to be a director, right? Hi, everybody, we're gonna do this thing, and, and it does happen. So as I was able to place myself in that, uh, in this, this vast universe, you see how big it is, and getting bigger, I realized that it was not through productions or even stylistically, although I do use the elements intuitively, um, non-mimetic movement, repetition, improvisation, and primary, what I heard in all of the sessions, uh, is we want you. We want you. We want your light. Yeah, we know how to write characters. We know how to direct. We know that. We got that. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful form, no problem. That's not what we're doing. We're doing something to bring you into the world. And that uh, is, uh, it, it, to me, is essential. So I haven't, I haven't directed a lot of, uh, I don't have a lot of directing credits. You know, I've been doing this for decades. And so I had to ask myself, what you been doing then, oh director? And I came to this. I've been turning over the topsoil. Yes. Yes. I've been turning over the topsoil yes. in places that were dry and barren, and I knew there was lush fertility underneath. Uh, uh, community, um, community centers in, in, in Louisville, Kentucky, mm -hmm. in Chicago, in New York, mm -hmm. in South Africa. Everybody thinks nothing's going to grow there. It's dust. They're just not paying any attention to it. That's the ones I like. Yes. Turning over the topsoil. So this convening and being asked this question, as we are community, has given me that. Yes. My grounding is, and, and how, the, how I knew these elements to use was through relationship. And I will say with 
real honor and gratitude that is through the relationships with three massive innovators in theatrical jazz, Lori Carlos, Aisha Rahman, and Antezaki Shange. As I was writing my most recent book, I received visitations from all of these artistic ancestors. And I thought, wow, girl, you actually knew them, know them, and they speak to you. So I, I'll just do a little of, of that chronology because it, it, it wasn't about what I had directed, it was about those relationships. And um, my, my dear friend and early collaborator, Dawn Jones, is in, she, uh, in, the, in the audience. She referenced this morning, Jonesy talked about us dancing with the Art Ensemble of Chicago in 1970s, early 1970s Chicago. And yeah, can see that. yes, Yay! you can feel it, right? And so I said, oh, that's how it's done. So I learned dance and, you know, I was trained in ballet and all those things, but I learned this aesthetic on the bandstand. And I really loved, like, you know, we'd come and we thought we were doing, they said, no, we're doing something different. We're like, okay. And that's exactly the way I work. My, you know, my cast say, weren't we gonna do this today? I said, yeah, but we're doing something different. Oh, yes. And it is, it, it, it's, it's a gift. So, um, and I really started, here we go, sneaking into jazz clubs with a fake ID on the Lower East Side when I was 14, what? 14. But that's how I had to have the music. That was the passion of it. I could not be separated from it, still can't. Um, and then I came back from Chicago and in 1974 was cast by the magnificent Musician, performing artist, Novella Nelson. My first director was a black woman. And she cast me, I was 19 years old, in Les Femmes Noires at the Public Theater with Lori. Lori was a young mother. And I was, you know, I was right up under her. Like, what are we doing, you know? She, and Amber, her daughter, this is was, this was a very strong memory because I saw a brilliant artist who was a mother, young mother, and Amber would be sitting very quietly. You know, chill, theater children know what to do. They're like, we're just gonna be here all night, so just relax. And uh, I'll never forget, she had these Snoopy boots, and she'd swing her Snoopy boots. And that seemed to keep her, you know, calm and, and, and happy as a child while we created this extraordinary work. And that was a cast. Now, all of those nine women went on to, to do exceptional things. Um, Lori and I continued to work together in different ways throughout her career, and w twice with um, with Entezaki. And once I was uh, an actor, Zaki was directing, and I what was the first one? Photograph, a, a lo photograph, Lovers in Motion, right? And he, it was Lovers in Motion had changed. It was written uh, study in cruelty, and then it went to lovers in motion. You gotta have some kind of happy ending sometimes, you know. Um, and boogie woogie landscapes, which was not a happy ending. Um, and and I'll just jump in here. Sometimes in the theater, we learn from those difficult, heartbreaking experiences. Yes. They clarify what we don't want yes. and what we're not gonna do. And we, and what I love in the theaters, we don't romanticize. We say, that was a, that was a, but I figured out what I wanted to do and I was able to shift and go more clearly in the direction um, that I'm called. And I, I must go back to Aisha because I felt like I was kind of in Aisha's wake, um, that she, she was the first cultural uh, director, uh, community cultural director in, Amherst, and I came right after she was there. But I knew her from Harlem. Somehow I remember being in her apartment on 153rd Street and being awed by her. I just could feel her magnificence um, as, as an artist, as a being, as a true innovator. A rela she says, I have to do this, I must write. And of course that's how she was able to uh, mentor so many writers. She said, do you have to do it? 
yes, then you will do it and it will work. And she, um, we worked together at Crossroads Theater. Talvin Wilkes is in the audience, right? Aisha's mojo and the say so. So I give you all those details and those very precious anecdotes because that's my experience in theatrical jazz was the love of those three women and, and that, that relationship that, as I said, emerges in the book. Um, I just, as I said, I didn't craft a career. It was just the next beautiful thing. And this is apparently the next beautiful thing. Well, and I'll, I'll conclude by saying I have a deep relationship to South Africa and what's happening in South Africa as we sit here and speak is also a new timeline. We, we may, have, may be able to get into that maybe um, over tea or drinks or whatever you do, but I'm so, it's like that's the top soil that's calling me right now. And in, um, I went as a guest artist for a few weeks but as soon as I put my feet on that soil in 2002, I said, oh, I saw the mountain. I said, oh, OK, I'll be here for a while. And um, created Brown Paper Studio. And in a funny way, I didn't even know, I, I had no idea what it was. I was back in New York after I'd been working, because I had to come back and hustle money and then go back to South Africa and do that. And someone says, oh, what you doing in South Africa? I said, oh, I, I do this thing at a school, and we, you know, we do theater. She said, oh, you're doing applied theater. I said, what is that? I went and Googled it. People were getting degrees in it. I didn't know. So that's another aspect, that theatrical jazz was, oh, that's what we're doing. Of course, Omi's is a crystal lens that we, we're all expanding in. Um, yeah, so I will just say that I am right now looking at what's happening in South Africa, which just as a, 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 like a political footnote, what is happening in these past two weeks is as big as what happened in 1994. Big deal. And, it, and that's in some way, in, in many ways, why I'm saying it's not disconnected from what we are doing here. What we are grounding this way of working that is profoundly African diasporic was fed by that and this, this cycle is being mm, expanded and enriched. So, thank you, that is, that's yeah. very... Um, <clears throat> in our program, I, after I, I had conversations with you all, I, was, I did homework. I made special questions for everybody. And then I said, then I started to see the connections. So I want to jump in. Oh, we are at ah, one question. Um, this is from the program that was created by my dear, dear friend and sister, Dr. P. And it's an a, a excerpt from Zaki's quote. I would suggest that, this is Zaki's words, I would suggest that we demolish the idea of a straight theater for a decade or so, refuse to allow playwrights to work without dancers and musicians. And I want to pose this to us. Can you talk about the music in your room? All of us intuitively have a way that we use music, in, sometimes literally, or sometimes, you know, you have that thing you put on heavy rotation until the people in your house go, don't play that again. But it, is, it will define the rhythm, the shape of what you're directing. So I just say, the music in your room. Is that a, is that a question? Mm -hmm. Good. I'll, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> um, no, but uh, um, I love how you put that, and I love that quote as well, because um, something that makes me feel a little kooky is like I was a classical actor uh, for like a long time, um, and I actually just did As You Like It at La Jolla. It was dramaturging, and I ended up in it. And so, <laughs> yeah, um, every dramaturg's dream, but uh, it was very fun. And it was directed by Will Davis. But the thing is, um, theater used to always only be that. It actually used to only always have this multiplicity and it, this composition, and the music is always there. And so I can use that example, like I was saying, it's sat Shakespeare's Saturday Night Live. It's, it's not that deep, you know? And, and if you can just, especially the comedies, and As You Like It is known as the first musical because it actually had so much music in it. And so I said, okay, well, why don't we take these five places? There would usually be music. Let's put pop, 
put pop culture in there. So there's like Talking Heads is in there, like Rihanna was in there. Like there was like all of these different things um, that we were able to apply. But it felt so natural, I think in that same sense. Um, I go back to poetics, I teach poetics and people you know, have mixed feelings about that. But when I teach script analysis, I always start with poetics because I do think that people need to understand that music and text and your body and the set that all the the um, the uh, Deus Machina right like that these things were necessary components of theater. Theater was considered incomplete if you were just talking for a long, long time. So when music is in the room, I think finding a rhythm together. Um, I usually do that as well physically. So we will get up and dance together. Um, usually at the start of every process, I like to see how people move. Um, I always do dance breaks. I definitely do playlists for every single show that usually ends up being the intermission. <laughs> and um, curtain call music and just sort of lives in the world, right? So I'll let y'all talk about it. <laughs> no. You go. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to be brief. Okay. The music in the room is what we make. Music is, I'm, I may not be brief. Um, this is a very important question. I, I feel very strongly about this. Um, I think music uh, in the room is connected to blood, water, rhythm, breath, what's going on with your muscles, how synapses are firing, what you're thinking about, where your body and what you, where your mind is when you should be present, where does your mind go, how do you astral project, how do you call yourself back to yourself um, when you have been divided. This is this is it for me. You know the 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 musicality, um, and I talk about this when, um, when I'm with performers and actors in particular who have a certain type of training, is what are you hearing when you say what you're saying? Who are you speaking to? Not the people who are coming to see the ticket, you know, buy the tickets and see the thing, but who are you trying to connect with across time and space? And what frequency do you need to connect with them? This is this is the music. This is the music. This is this is um, why I'm not a fan of unison action. I'm not a fan of everybody, you know, doing the five, six, seven, eight, and then we all go at the same time. I'm not asking for you to be listening to the music in my head, in my body. I'm asking you to find your own. And this is very challenging for those who have been taught to uh, ease all of their grandmother's lilts out of their voice and sound like somebody else. And, and it is hard as hell to say, talk to your great grandmother right now. Talk to your great grandfather right now. What would, why would they even be listening to what you jabbering on about? And if they don't want to listen to you, why would anybody else? They love you. And that is, that is an ancestral calling to me, to find the music that your people's people's people would want to hear, not because you're singing like them, but because you sound like them because you sound like them, because you sound like you want to connect to them. I'm, you know, my folk, I'm the granddaughter of sharecroppers. I'm the granddaughter of sharecroppers. I'm the granddaughter of sharecroppers. I got somebody to talk to. I have a land to talk to. I have waters to talk to. I have trees to talk to. I'm not talking to people just because they bought a ticket. I could give two bleepity bleeps. I gotta t I'm talking about some I'm talking to somebody else because this is the domain I have to be in surround sound. This is the domain I have to use 15 people to talk to my people as a director. As a director. And I'm asking everybody 
to also be talking to their people. If you're only talking to the people in the room, you ain't talking to, you're not talking in the right direction. If you are that, if the, if, the, if the energy lands at that back wall, you missed it. This is what I say. This is what I offer. This is, this is the opportunity is to speak in multi-dimensions, to speak across time and space, to speak back, to speak forward, to speak down, to speak up. And it's so hard when we live in a totalitarian state, when we live under domination, to hear your own music. It's so hard when you've been told to be in line, to get this and do that, and the capitalist this and the blah, blah, blah. Where is your music? And I, I struggle with actors, y'all. I struggle with actors. They leave. They leave because it's not enough in the domain that they understand where they've trained, who they, who they train with. They can name 15 white folks that told them to do it like Meisner and can't even name their great grandmother. And we got a problem. It's this, it's what's the, who, again, who's the music for? Who's the music for? Who's the, who are you speaking to? And why you don't sound like them? Are you afraid to sound like them? There's something there. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I can, this, this I could go on. This I could go on. Because it's like, I was working with uh, the performers who, who I brought with me, who will be um, sharing later this evening. There's a word in what they say, mud, what one of the actors says, mud bound. I said, you said mud bound. What does mud bound mean? What does it mean to be bound in the mud? Say it like that. Mud bound. What about bound takes your voice from this to that? How do we know that you actually mud bound without you moving in mud? Say it. And that, that is a lilt, that is a riff, that is jazz without scatting, that is scatting. That is, that's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm trying to ask people to reach for. Um, and if you don't want to go back and think about your great-grandmother, then don't come over here. It's going to be hard and crunchy, and it's going to hurt. And I'm not trying to hurt. I'm not trying to make anybody hurt. I'm not. I'm really not. But it's a choice to not sound like your people. And this is a, maybe a little bit of a tangent, but I'm going I'm to I'm do it. Okay. Uh, I'm also um, more interested in, I miss this, I miss this uh, workshop, but maybe it'll happen again tomorrow, channeling and being a conduit instead of being in a character. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I'm, I'm interested in people going with ancestral memory as the journey, right? to bring them in, to sound like them, to walk like them. You know, there's this thing. And I, I, you know, I, I trained at NYU. And so I'm like, I work with a lot of NYU trained act. Oh, I, maybe I shouldn't have said all that name. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, there is a thing that is like, you know, that flattens out the round, rotund, luscious, um, molassesy, bluesy, gutter tones that we have access to. We don't have to stay there, but what's in your actual sonic toolkit? What are you like? I, if you only sound like the way they told you to sound, then woo, we got a long way to go. We got a long way to go. We, I gotta direct your voice. My God, I got to direct you back into your voice? You mean you inhabit it in such a way that you can't even sound like you? We have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. And so that reclamation, that rememory, that capture, that capture, that coming home to self, Calling your voice, your voice, your people's voice back into your body. That's the music. 
calling it back. Come on in, Sydney. Yes, yeah, so yes. Yeah, so I'll just say really quickly too, because um, I know that we're short on time. I'll just say I think yes to what Ebony said, and and one offering you talked a lot about the voice. I'm going to talk about the structure for just a moment. Right. So um, ritual has a structure. A church service has a structure. I think that theater, we can use those structures that are spiritual and ritual based to help inform a higher vibration of the story. And so you're talking about coming back to yourself and your voice, and I'm thinking about the technologies of ritual that help to have a different kind of impact on the body and the spirit inside of a performance environment, inside of the ritual that we are collectively creating and experiencing in the ceremony and the divination and the invocation of that. So I think from a melodic and a music structure, when I say the, the music's what we're making, I'm also interested in what's the chorus? What's the hook? What's the verse? What's the time? Yeah. What's the, all of that, right? And this is where theatrical jazz becomes such a useful toolkit but find all the tools that you've got on your belt. And you have many. Mm -hmm. I knew you had more to say. Okay. I just, I'm trying to be sensitive to time. Well, time is, you know, time is collapsing. So Mi microphone, microphone. Is... We'll pass it to oh, I'm sorry. Time is collapsing, and we have time for one question from the audience, one or two. Yeah, we, no, we, we did it a different kind of way. This was a song, was it, what was a quartet? We yeah. just sang this today, so <laughs> each session had its different shape. Please come down and ask from the mic. Oh, you just with us? You got the. Thank you, thank you. Are there any questions in the audience? Just appreciation. Thank you. I want to say that yes. Can you ask from the the mic for the purpose of recording? Hi, um, this is going all the way back to the beginning. Um, oh gosh, where was my note? I'm sorry. Um, somebody mentioned being mentored by the archive first. I think it was you, yeah, thank you. Can you say more about that? I'm voracious about it, and it's because I spent a lot of time in institutional spaces that buried what I needed to hear. And so um, I, I am bookish, I am a researcher, and I will read as much as I possibly can before I say a word about, about it. Um, I think what is available when one invests in archival ceremony what becomes available is um, the, like what Signe had us do, the connections. So connecting Dr. Omi to Dr. Madison, connecting this place to that place, it's been talked about. But for me, I, um, I'm so deep in archival practice that I wanna know, I really wanna know, um, where this has come from three or four levels deep. And I, most of the time when I'm working on a piece, um, it's spent on working with my studio and having folks actually investigate the archive, read it, embody it, reinterpret it, act it, go to the place where it came from. And I find this to be in, in the tradition of Zora Neale Hurston. Um, you know, go and sit with the thing, go and sit with the people, go and sit with the place, go and be. You have to go there to know there. And I find um, one of the things that makes me very like um, bored is undercooked opportunities. And you don't know what season it is need to be there if you don't read and research and get it inside of you. You can't do something you don't know. You can't initiate yourself into something that you have never invested in. You could call yourself that, but anyone who actually knows better knows that you don't know. You just use in language, and what is that for? And so my, my opportunity uh, the opportunities that have been made available to me by all my, my teachers is, is that of deep study, deep presence. Read the books, why not? You know, 
look at the documentaries, ask questions. What is, what is becoming in this current work that I'm doing is really uh, important to me is the living archive, is going and sitting on a porch for hours and eating the tomato that they grew in their garden, you know? Going and asking folks, what's growing on your farm? Signe has harvested these herb, these plant, plant uh, elements for us and then took the time to sit down with the folks that I brought here, and this is that, and that is that, and that is that, and we have it all documented, you know? Because that is how we, we know again. That's how we continue to know. So yeah. And I'll just say to that living archive piece, so um, I also think that the where the study is different for all of us up here, and, and I don't have the same access to the academic rigor of research in that way. My education is much more about a, a, a political education, is much more about a popular education. And so I participate in a lot of community listening and learning. And so like with Million Artist Movement, um, a group of artists and activists who work at the intersections of black liberation and art and politics, we study together. And we read not just the practitioners of art, but the practitioners of revolution. And so I also think the who you study is not just maybe the, the usual suspects. It's also from other places and other timelines that can help to influence the future. And to the point of the porch and the plants, we have a quilting project that invites people to come and tell their stories, ask questions, elevate ancestors, lift up revolutionaries, um, talk to their, their spirit's desire, and do that through a quilting square, which is a technology that we've known that goes way, way back. And now we have like over 2,000 square feet of community quilt that has participated in protests, has, lives in museums, has wrapped someone who was cold around a campfire at a occupation of a police station. Like all of those things because we can also animate object and story as archive and art becomes the, 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 the freeway or the technology to do that. So yes to rigorous study and we're sitting in the academic, but also fuck the academy because they ain't know what shit was anyway. We actually do know. So yes, I want us to archive, but I don't want to replace that and give that power over to the academy because the people done known if we take the time to ask and listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow, I wanted you to talk about million artists and, and, and just, well, divine timing. The ancestor is going to get everything said and needs to be said. So I'm going to make a few concluding remarks and um, again, Really, really, really honored to share the space with, with all of us. There is something about being together in proximity on the land, even when it's a city that is required for artists. We have to have time together. We have to eat together. We have to hear each other's stories. We have to live together. And that is more and more precarious right now. We're all being, we're all being driven off our own land. We're being treated, we are supposed to be refugees on our own home land. It won't happen. It won't be successful, but it's really under pressure now. So the fact that we are together and affirming what I learned from Zaki, art family, my art family has grown exponentially in two days. And we will hold on to this. I love digital media. We can use it and then this time together. So I'm just putting it, we will come together as often as we can and sit and eat and know each other and get those rhythms of our bodies and our language, right, and our histories. Very valuable. And I'm, this room is filled with my art family, which moves me deeply. Um, and finally, I want to say, I wanted to get to this wonderful question that came up this morning, but maybe it's one for, for our continued uh, uh, connections about the word theater. I like the word theater. I like it. I like living in that world. I think it is right now the most sacred place we have in the society that has attempted d dissolution and the destruction, the destruction of literal humanity turning us into robots it can't happen in theater. You can have beautiful sets and everything, but the people in on the stage, it's an installation. It's not theater. Theater is the hearing place. Theater is the place of rehearsal. And it is the place that will 
generate the next societies we're going to. It will not, it's not on the sidelines. We are center stage right now. And this collapse that we're experiencing globally, let it go. Because we're ready. We're rising. Thank you very much. Ashe. Ashe.